Thank you, Comrade Diop. Uh, this is going to be a very important discussion. If I've asked uh, Comrade Luizzi, uh, Kinshasa, uh, our Secretary General of ASI to participate in this uh, discussion with me. Um, and I'm hoping that um, we don't, I'm hoping that, that I'm not uh, excessive in, in the use of time here because um, I know we only have a certain amount of time and um, while I'm not opposed to going a little longer than ha we have to if necessary today, I know that uh, Secretary General uh, has a meeting with the comrades in the Caribbean after this, and I also want to pull together a meeting with the National Central Committee uh, so that we can do a little summing up of, of the, con the plenary itself after this. But there are some things that I, I do want to talk about in this related. Um, and I was reflecting on a discussion that um, we almost had on yesterday when a comrade brother raised the question of the dependency of the party on the white people in the solidarity movement. And I think that's a really important question and I think that we in the African People's Socialist Party and our whole movement needs, need uh, to be able uh, to understand this issue and this question. Because part of what's being discussed uh, is related to this whole issue of the national question, how we understand uh, and interpret this issue. But part of what's being discussed um, is the fact that the African People's Socialist Party some years ago made a certain determination based on our, um, our theory that we are a nation of people, first of all. We are a nation of people. We're not a race, we're a nation. And it's a na nation that has been dispersed throughout the world. We reject as strongly uh, as is possible the whole notion that somehow we are some kind of race. Like white people are nations and we are a race. And, um, and based on this understanding, based on our understanding of primitive accumulation, that capitalism itself uh, was born of the attack on Africa, our enslavement and colonization. That from this arose uh, capitalism and the white nation itself that did not exist prior to this. In fact, the reality is that, uh, that uh, it was slavery and colonialism that gave birth to the white man. For that, there was no such thing. I mean, there were people who looked a certain way. There was no such thing as the white man or the European. These are concepts that were born of our experience, and the so-called, and the European nation itself was consolidated. And there are certain components that we know for sure, because there's a lot of controversy and has been historically around what is a nation? Well, we aren't going to deal with controversy because we've decided, you know, what it, that we're the nation. Uh, so if anybody want to debate that, that's their problem, not ours. Uh, but the thing is that we know that before slavery, which gave rise to capitalism itself, there was no such thing as we, that we would characterize as the white, as the European nation. That before the attack on black people and other peoples around the world. What we call white people now and what we call Europeans now were primarily fighting each other. They were constantly at war with each other. That's how Europe was known. It was known as a nasty, stinking place where people are always at war with each other. That's how other people who knew a little bit about this place over there, that's what was known of it. They defined themselves primarily in relationship to each other. So they were constantly at war. You know, that's where the words like barbarians and, and uh, what are the other terms that vandals, et cetera, those were real groups of white people. And what they did, how they acted, 
is something that's gone on for centuries to define peop unruly behavior. Uh, and that was a white thing, if you will. It was only through slavery and colonialism that this motley crew uh, was consolidated and defined themselves primarily in relationship to the rest of us. And this was not something that happened because of a genetic problem or a religious problem, the absence of God or some other thing like that, or preponderance of sin on anybody's part. It was born out of an economic re relationship and where, where Europe and these warring white people rescued themselves from poverty and disease through the abundance that they stole from Africa, from Asia, and from what we now call America. I'm not just talking about something that you have to speculate on. You can even read the words of Cecil Rhodes, who himself said that how he was walking through London and saw masses of white people talking about bread, demanding bread, bread, bread. They were hungry, had nothing to eat. And he said, then it, it came up, uh, to me that in order to keep this thing together, we had to become imperialists. We had to build an empire. And they struck out and they went to Africa. Not because it was barbaric and poverty stricken because there was famine there, but because it was wealthy. Because that's where the resources were, et cetera. And he struck out and he went and stole every goddamn thing they could steal. That's why right now Mugabe is being attacked because they're trying to get back the land that Cecil Rose and his ancestors and, and, and those who uh, followed him stole. And so here you have the rise uh, off of that, of stealing us. The reason you go to a, a supermarket and pick up something that's called Aunt Jemima's pancake or Uncle Ben's rice is because, because culturally, this is our culture, everybody older becomes an auntie or uncle, etc. And the white people would take our aunties and aunties and for them, it was derisive because they weren't nobody's aunties and uncles. Hell, if you weren't in the, if you wasn't, if you weren't a husband and a wife or one of the two children or the cat, then you didn't have any relationship to them. But ours, our culture extended our relationships, you know, all the way. So everybody, uncle, auntie, if you're older, you don't have to be blood relationship. If you're older, you're somebody. And but the thing is, when you go to the supermarket today, and get Aunt Jemima's pancake mix, something that the little old neo-colonial uh, petty bourgeois Negroes hate to see that anti-stiff, you know? It is precisely because we made the pancake mix. We made the pancakes. We did the rice. We did all of the stuff that brought wealth and comfort and resources to them. We created the universities. The, the knowledge of the stars and stuff. They're talking about Galileo, Hell, Mali. The Dogon and Mali had discovered thousands of years ago how the universe and the stars work. Egypt, Olmec, that was a black thing. So we have this, this newcomers, hungry, desperate newcomers to human history. And they attacked Africa and the rest of the world and rescued themselves. Uh, in a way that now they have achieved identity. And their, their identity was achieved. This is what's really important. They're not just Europeans or white people or Americans. Their identity was achieved as a part of the process of taking away the identity and resources of every damn body else. So here you have the emergence of the white nation, right? And, and the emergence of the rest of us as races, or tribes, or any other kind of characterization that's imposed on us by people who need to define their own reality, and they become the subjects of history, and we become the objects of history because they are defining us. The definition of the tribe, the race, didn't come from us. We didn't wake up one day and say, hey, let's be a race. 
somebody else to serve their own requirements, to move forward in history, made that kind of determination. They define themselves as people do. And they define everybody else in relationship to them. So that's what we understand in part by the whole question of race and even nations. And the thing is, when I was a young person and became aware of this relationship between what we now characterize or often hear characterized black people and white people, I was mad as hell. When I could see with my own eyes the brutality, the despicable brutality imposed on our people by white people, not by Jesus or some, some alien force, but white people. The fear that you lived with, that you lived, you grew up with, you know the fear, and Africans know it today too. It just comes in a different form from a, wearing a uniform now. But it didn't have to wear a uniform, although sometimes it did wear a uniform because my boogeyman, when I was growing up, the thing that my mother would use to tell me that you gotta come in and not stay out late at night was the Ku Klux Klan. Because there were white people out there, white men, you grew up knowing that, who would do all kinds of terrible things to you. That informed my consciousness, shaped my consciousness, not just me, but all other black men who were out there. Of course, there were some who I'm proud to, to, to be able to say, and who may not have been political in many other ways, but knew that, that well, and white people knew it, that if you lay a hand, look wrong on me or mine, you would die. Even if I have to die, you're going to die. That's a hell of a statement to make. And the world won't mess with you if they know you might kick my ass, but if you kill me, you're going to die. Your children are going to die. Terrible things are going to happen. You, you'll be surprised how many people stop messing with you. Even if somebody know they can beat you up, they're going to jump on you, they can beat you up. They know they can beat you up. But if they know they're going to leave wounded, they will walk around you most of the time. And, and we have to, but, but the thing is, there were people like that in our communities. And, and, and to... And to, and to Forgive their cowardice. What the whites would use to say, well, don't mess with him, that nigga crazy. No? So the nigga crazy, don't mess with him. You understand? The other ones <laughs> who are sane, let's go kill them. Let's go kill some sane niggas. You understand? <laughs> so I, 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 you know, when I, the first thing that you do, if you are unfortunate enough to have a good education, your first thing you do is you love white people. Because having a good education means that the colonizer has got a good grip on your brain. They've taught you all this stuff, the Pledge of Allegiance. You become better Americans than the Americans are. You become better French than the French. We got a Negro who was president in Senegal who used to come and criticize the French because they didn't speak good enough French. You know, he, he you know, I mean, uh, um, uh, sing ho, you know, and 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 so you know that's the first thing. If you're if you're if you're unfortunate enough to be well educated, masses of Africans out there they don't have some of these kind of problems, cause they haven't gone through that stuff that can you know say oh yeah the white this and all of this and Columbus this and Columbus that you know uh, uh, etc. In fact, that's one of the problems they got because that's one of the uh, that's one of the reasons that. The, the Africans say that you act, you know, the students, you know, who's Negroes who are supposed to be the best students, the Africans always tell them, you act like you're white. And, and there's this big uproar about that because they, they say, you know, there's something wrong with the, the, this is the pathology in our community because uh, the, the, the good students uh, uh, are told by the other students that if, you, if you're successful in class that you're trying to be white. And therefore, what it means is, if, you, if you're getting a good education, if you're studying hard, you're trying to be white, and that's why they don't study. No, that ain't why. They don't call it saying that they're trying to be white because they are learning. They say you're trying to be white because they are trying to be white. Because that is the process, that, that's what the educational process is. It is a process of, it's a civilizing process. Is for the old education, is a, and by that, what I mean is, is shaping 
uh, the attitudes, the conscience, the spirituality of African people to reflect the slave master. So at the moment, you know, you break free from that and find out that you, here, here you are, calling the slave master our forefathers. I mean, and you only do that if you got a good education. So you had to go through that stuff to be our forefathers. You know, uh, and I'm talking about somebody who actually owned my forefathers, who murdered and brutalized. And that's our forefathers. Well, you've been had. You're in bad trouble. You know you are in trouble when that happens to you, right? We're talking about the national question now. Because the white people are the nation and you the race, as quiet as it's kept. Even though they say, you say the same pledge, <laughs> you become black, you want black Asian unity, and that's your, <laughs> they the nation and you the race, <laughs> you understand? And uh, it confuses and confounds and place all kinds of obstacles in the way of our collective progress. Because to say, solve the racial problem, what you're always doing, how do you solve the racial problem? You solve the racial problem by doing everything you can to be accepted, to be liked, to be one of them. And like we say, Michael Jackson is a poster child in many ways. Rich, extraordinarily talented, but can never be satisfied because he ain't white. So he does everything he can. He mutilates himself on a constant basis. He tries to talk right. You know what I mean? <laughs> he tries to look right. Put so much stuff in his hair. Y'all remember that time he stood next to a hot light bulb and his hair caught on fire? Because <laughs> Africans, people, our hair has muscles in it. Our hair got muscles in it. Don't just look like that ordinarily and naturally, that stuff, you know. Uh, yeah, my mama was a beautician. I grew up in a beauty shop. It's amazing. And I don't know how they do it today, or if they still do it. But when I was growing up, you know, you sit down, sit down, my mama, these women, my mama, you know, other women who worked in the shop, she kept this, this, this iron instrument, tool, called a straightening comb. They heat it up to this red hot, white hot. And then, and then put it on that hair, right? This close to the brain, you understand? And they pull it in and you hear that hair. That's like, sound like rice crisps. <laughs> Snap, crackle and pop, you know. It's amazing, you understand? Cause that hair got muscle in it. It won't just stand like that by itself, will it y'all? Y'all know what I'm talking about. And then, and then you see these sisters that if it's raining, these sisters learn how to run between the raindrops, you understand? <laughs> Because if a drop of water hits it, those muscles snap back, boom, and will hit that skull with such a force that they end up with a concussion. You understand? Uh, <laughs> but, you know, that's, that's the consequence of struggling, right, to, to perceiving the world and yourself through the eyes of your oppressor. Your oppressor is defined who you're supposed to be, how you're supposed to look, how you're supposed to smell, how you're supposed to walk, whether you should have hair under your arms or not, whether you should shave your legs, whether you should, all of that stuff, your oppressor has done that. You don't even have an idea. You do have good instincts and you got ideas because there's a lot of stuff that they haven't been able to kill. But what they couldn't kill, what they did was make you hate it so much in yourself, and then they adopted it for themselves. Because you used to be able to dance and sing and all of that. Y'all remember that? And remember when, when your booty was something that they told you you should be ashamed of? Remember when they told you your lips were something you should be ashamed of, right? Your skin color was something you should be ashamed of. They make you hate it. And they make you hate it enough, and then, and then you buy all the stock you can in skin lightening stuff. And in every corner you pass, there's a tanning bed, you know, or, or something else that uh, 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 you got 
nationally, internationally televised programs. This is the most offensive thing I've ever seen in my life. This is the essence of parasitism, by the way, that we're looking at. Internationally, international programs, television, televised programs of white people awarding themselves as being the best singers, the best dancers, and what have you. After that made you hate dancing. Now, you don't, you don't dance like that anymore, and you walk, you know, like you got the whole eggs between your knees, you know, et cetera, so that you can, uh, 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 you used to walk, like, you know, used to walk because the body, human, African body and everything was an art, and the way you walk, to watch an African walk across the room, whoa, you know, and uh, the pimp limp and the whole thing that we used to do. But that became a sign of a certain kind of savagery and a lack of civilization. And so you stopped. And now you see John Travolta, to whatever his name is, and whatever that song is, you know, where he's walking and, uh, you know, so what the hell is this? You understand? You know, and, and Angela Jolie done stole your lips. And people getting injections in the booty. And, and uh, it's extraordinary, isn't that something? Uh, 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 but that's the essence of parasitism, where your singing used to be a sign of uh, what kind of abandon they used to characterize a certain kind of abandon and lack of inhibitions and stuff that Africans had, the way you sing. I mean, you know, uh, like, here's a song. This, this is not part of the lyrics. You know, you say, ow, I feel good. <laughs> You know, uh, you know, I mean, what, what, you, you look for the lyrics, of, and that's not written down in there. You understand? And so you hear, you know, you hear Little Richard, you know, Little Richard tried to get back at him because they were stealing everything. So he, he would make songs, you know, that was, you know, words are too fast. White people can't say, tootie footy, oh my Rudy, tootie footy, oh my Rudy, and bop, bop, boom, bop, 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 here's here. But Pat Boone. Tutti frutti, omaruti. <laughs> and they just don't know that they had to stop Little Richard from saying what, what was the real, the real song really was when he first wrote it was Tutti frutti, good booty, you know. <laughs> They said, Richard, you can't say that. <laughs> Richard, we can't put that on the record. <laughs> Should have put it on there. <laughs> but, but anyway, you know, I do digress. I do digress. But that's, that's the essence of parasitism. And it, you know, took us through this. And I'm, I'm mad as hell. Because you, you learn to hate yourself and all the things that's about you. You know, and you try, you have to become an imitation of your oppressor. And when you learn, you come to this, and my first response was hatred. Because all of that I've just talked about requires self-hatred in order to move through the thought, you know. And if you hate yourself, if you hate your black self, you have to hate everything that's like you. You hate your mama, you might not know it, but you do. You hate your children, your brothers, and your sisters. You know, you, if you feel what self, if you hate yourself, you feel like, in fact, you hate your wife, your lover, because something must be as, as bad as I am, and they with me. <laughs> you understand? Something must be worse. Something must be wrong with them even to be with me. And it's not something that you think about, but that's the reality of our relationships as long as we are filled with the stuff that's been pumped into us. And, and so one of the means by which a nation has been held in bondage is to define it out of history by characterizing it as something like a race or a tribe and the other kinds of terminology that's being used against us. So you can't have a struggle for racial liberation. Let's have a, how do you liberate, how do you have a racial liberation movement, you know? Because nations are associated, there are certain things in the real world that you associate with nations. And one of the things that's associated with nations is economics. There are, there are subjective and there are objective factors that, that help to define what a nation is. A nation is a group of people who experience 
a sense of sameness. You know, whether they call themselves or are called Eskimos or Cherokees or what have you, there's a sense of sameness because it requires, first of all, uh, us to feel that way about ourselves and that way about each other. And even if we call ourselves black Brits or Negro Americans, we experience, when we see African people anywhere suffering a certain consequence, we experience that, no matter where we are. That's why Africans, no matter where they are on the planet Earth, when they saw Obama elected president, that was, that was them. It wasn't just uh, the African Americans, as you would put it, or the Negro Americans. Africans experienced that, a sense of sameness. That's why even Uncle Toms do that. Even those people who learn how to speak properly and act properly, they don't like having a sense of sameness, right? But they are always willing to say how you hurting all of us because you act a certain way. Or uh, somehow they are embarrassed by what you do. Why are they embarrassed by what you do? Because they feel a sense of sameness with you. They hate it, but they do. And so a sense of sameness is what helps to constitute what you call a nation. And, and not only, but you just can't feel a sense of sameness and say, I'm a part of the nation. You can feel a sense of sameness, and if the body rejects you, you ain't a part of the nation. That's why I never forget this image. During the struggle in Boston around the school system, and Africans were out there demonstrating the right to go to school with the white people in Boston. And this African had, uh, uh, either he had American flag as a part of the demonstration or something, and this white man took that American flag and clubbed them damn near to death with the pole with the American flag. And just because you feel a sense of sameness with it doesn't mean that it accepts you. Because I was a fool. I, I felt more same than they felt. You understand? Uh, uh, and so it's not enough, you know. That's why Jews change their names in this country, right? Because it wasn't enough for you to feel a sense of sameness, right? That you had to, you had to, you know, if the, if the group, if the group, the body rejects you, you're not a part of the nation. I don't care what you think about it, right? So there's a subjective component to this. And an aspect of the subjective component is, is the way you look. Because you look alike, you look like my mom or my cousin. You know, you go to Africa, you find somebody who you just left in Detroit who look just like, damn. Remember Richard Pryor does this thing where he goes to Africa, walking down the street and well, went to a bank and he said, damn, the banker, that's Joe Frazier. <laughs> 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 so, uh, you know, you, you have that contributes to the subjective factor. We look alike. And, and there are other kinds of things that contribute, uh, tr contribute to that. We like the same music. And you got to like the same music because all music comes from Africa. That's, and that's, that's just an objective reality. I used to make jokes about elevator music, but all the elevator music, too. It has its origin, you know, like in Africa. You know, uh, 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 the barbershop quartet, -ling -ling, Africa. Banjo, Africa. You know, all of it, you know, uh, but the cultural thing, because we do the cultural things differently. Even though all comes from Africa, everybody don't say, oh, I feel good, <laughs> right? Uh, some people say it. I feel wonderful, <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's a, the spiritual cultural component that even like Christianity, and I say even Christianity because I have even Christianity. Uh, we do it differently from white folks. Or we used to. Because the same way white folks used to denounce you because the way you did Christianity, now you see Jimmy Swagger, you know, and all these others, you know, who are uh, imitating the way you do Christianity. Because the way you do Christianity is the way you did religion on the continent. You just came back and added another God to it or, you know, another hymn to it or something to that effect. But that's how we have, that was our experience. You, do, you go to the church, used to be able to go to church on, 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 on Sunday, 
right, and see Africans getting down in church, and you see the same moves you saw on Saturday when you was in the club. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> you see the same moves, uh, you know. Uh, uh, so, 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 uh, you know, the thing is that there, there, there's, there, are, there are the subjective factors as well, you know, that, that contribute to the, who the nation is. You had spiritual out, there's certain spiritual uh, unity, that, you know, the way we look, the dance and singing and reggae can happen uh, in Jamaica and somebody can be dumb enough to think that it originated on that island and don't get it that the person who's singing reggae on that island did not originate there. And that what you got in the form of reggae there is something that is, came from Africa over there. And the only reason that like somebody said, well, why, you know, all of us are Africans, we come, all of us come from Africa, right? You say, but in, in, all of us treated badly. In fact, in, 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 in Barbados, uh, we were treated so badly that the average lifespan of an African in Barbados was seven years. Seven, kill them. Seven years, dead, right? Uh, and they say, you know, we all come from the same place, right? Say, so, but why is it that uh, in America, America is the only place where you saw Africans doing the blues? You know, we sang the blues in America. The, and, 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 uh, but why is that? And it ain't cause there was some profound difference in Africans here uh, in the Caribbean or in, on the continent of Africa. It's the white folks are scared of the drum, and they took the drum from us here. They took the drum. And since they took the drum, it made a difference in how we moved the rhythms and other kinds of stuff that we did. So we had the drums in the islands. We had the drums, you know, uh, and, and, you know, we modified certain kinds of stuff in terms of drumming here, but that's the fundamental thing. So the blues is African. If you don't believe it, you know, I have seen Africans on the continent with that little thing that's, that's a precursor to the guitar, that what we now call the guitar. And he's down there playing, he sounds just like John Lee Hooker. Or John Lee Hooker sounds just like, you know, him. You know, because that's an African thing that we hear. And when we hear reggae, you know, uh, when we, you know, hear what is called Afro-Cuban, you know, sound, all of that is Africa. And so there is, there is this thing that, that we have, that's ours, you know, it's our culture, the rhythms and everything, that's us, that's who we are, you know. That's why Obama, you know, with all of his problems, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, can function and act certain kinds of ways that I won't get into because it's too goddamn stereotypical. <laughs> but uh, so, so that's a factor in what helps to say who the nation is. You know, the, 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 the culture, the spiritual, that kind of uh, thing that uh, unites us all. And, and you'll find it in various places around the world, you know, where black people are. And, and the way we look is a thing that unites us all. You find the same empathy, the same sympathies, the same feelings uh, are being expressed uh, uh, with the so-called aboriginal in Australia, you know. You go to Cambodia. And uh, if you look at some of the ancient uh, art masks and stuff in Cambodia, it looked just like something you would find in West Africa or any other parts of Africa, et cetera. And my, my son, when he was a youngster, uh, he went to elementary school in California, and, and one of the little girls that was supposed to have been his girlfriend was from Cambodia. And I wouldn't have known it. I thought she was from Detroit. <laughs> That's a joke. And, uh, uh, and, and my younger, his younger brother, four years younger, used to, you know, make fun at him in a, uh, you know, really negative kind of way because he used to call his, his girlfriend Kung Fu Sally, you know, uh, <laughs> because of the, you know, the Asian, you know, connotation. Uh, but, the, but the reality is that, that, that uh, you know, we feel it and we experience that wherever we are because what has come to define us in the real world, in the real world, we have come to be defined by how we look, haven't we? And, and there was a time when it was real open by it. They used to have laws saying that if you got one-eighth percent, one-eighth of, of black blood, uh, then that makes you 
you know, like black or an African, if you will. When, when that thing gets turned around, I mean, uh, of course, if you ever did that the right way, a lot of quote unquote white people would be in big time trouble. <laughs> you know, uh, but like one eighth, that was enough. So the, the thing is that we, you know, we have us that kind of sense of sameness. We feel it. We may call ourselves funny things, but we feel the sense of sameness. There are people in this room born in different places. They don't open their mouths, et cetera, and you don't, you don't you hear the accent, et cetera. You know, you, there's no reason that you assume that they are not the same, right? You, you just, oh, you might act a little funny after you hear the French accent. You know, or something like that, but that's your problem. <laughs> it's our problem, really. But there's a sense of sameness. The other thing that's, that, that there's a material component, objective material component to it as well. So not just how you feel. There's an objective material component to it as well, and that's economic. That is a fundamentally important thing in terms of how nations are uh, consolidated, what gives one uh, a national identity, and in the instance of Europe, what was the primary factor that transformed this group of warring tribes uh, who were defined themselves primarily in relationship to each other and to this group all around the world? Because a, 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 a European in Australia is a European. And a European in New Zealand is a European. And in Canada and America and the rest is European. Same, the same. What is it that made that happen? And the primary factor that consolidated that, that created the material basis for the sense of sameness was economics. What's the economics are we talking about? We're talking about capturing, well, Two things. At one juncture, before the consolidation of capitalism, we're talking certainly about the Crusades, the war that was made against the Arabs that started looting, that looting process that they call the Crusades, which results in even these warring forces at some juncture referring to themselves, referring to where they lived as Christendom. This was called Christendom. There was no Europe. It was Christendom, because the contest, as they saw it at that juncture, the economic, the primary economic concept, the thing that, that, that the Pope used, was it Pope Innocent? Was one of them, wasn't it? That kicked out, the, you know, to have people going out to murder in terms of the Crusades, <clears throat> et cetera. It was a looting expedition in the name, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, let's go steal every damn thing that's not nailed down. It was a looting expedition. Just like Africans were brought here uh, from Holland, the first group of us, the first 20 of us, on what? The good ship, Jesus. Right? So at this looting expedition, and then you had the resistance and the fight between the, the, the Muslims and, and the Christians who were stealing things, but Christianity and Islam was just a, that was incidental. They would have done it, you know, uh, uh, if they were Zarathustrans, you know, and Luke was there. It didn't, that, that was incidental. It just so happened that people identified themselves as Islam and, and the Pope was in charge of stuff on the other side. So the Pope, you know, would rally the army in, in, in defense of, of, of Jesus and Christ and, and go loot people who had def defined themselves primarily as Islam. But it was a looting expedition. War made under the banner of the flag, of the Bible, of the cross, and what have you. And that helped to shape, began to define how these people, Europeans, identified themselves. The nation was not consolidated at this time yet. It wasn't consolidated uh, uh, because even then you had groups that would come together for a particular purpose and do this and then sort of go, you know, separate again until they call together to do something. It wasn't like you had an entity that was a consistently defined uh, group of folk who were always, you know, like united. There was no, nothing like that. And, and the other economic component, the defining, 
the defining economic component that can, can help to shape and define the European nation, the pivotal factor, the crucial factor, was the slave trade, was the capture, the attack on Africa. And this became the boom. This created the world economy. See, they were looting over there, but in, even they changed the shape and configuration of the world. Because up to now, the world did not include places that we now know as, Euro, as, as Cuba and, and South America and the Caribbean and all those areas. That world didn't even include that yet. It was, it was the slave trade, the, the attack on Africa, the capture of African people, the, the dispersal of Africans around the world, the creation of, of what we now know as, as what we now know as places like Argentina and Chile and Brazil and, and, and you know, all of the places in the Caribbean killing the indigenous population. That's one aspect of it. But the, the, the fundamental thing was putting Africans there and then creating value off of what Africans were produced, right? Uh, and that hooked the whole world up into a single world economy. This is the process. This is the, econo uh, the economic factor. The parasitic, it's a parasitic economy. And all of the Europeans rest, all of the European activity, I don't give a damn if the Swedes participated or didn't participate in slavery, it doesn't matter because the, the whole economy of the world that benefited white people, Europeans, this is a nation now that rises into existence as a consequence of what Marx called primitive accumulation, the capture of, 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 of resources, human resources in the form of African people, right? Our labor, our territories, et cetera, and also this place that we have, that we're living in right now. So all of this is you have this group now that rises and its sense of sameness is accomplished on the backs of a parasitic economy, which is why this, the, the sense of sameness in, in, the, in the, 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 the economic, the material uh, factor is the primary factor because that's why. You don't, you don't, you, you will have, white people have the same response to phenomenon all around the world when it attacks and when the parasitic economy is attacked. When, <clears throat> that's why it's so easy to think of the dirty Arab because the whole parasitic economy requires their stolen oil. That's why it's so easy to talk about <clears throat> the African barbarian because damn near every mineral and other resource necessary for the, the functioning of a so-called modern industrial society is located there. That's why it's so easy to hate the Africans and feel threatened by black people and other people around the world. All the white people feel threatened by that. That's why the white left, just like the white reactionaries, want the police to be here. That's why you can't get them to, talking about peace to stop the police from doing this and that to African people. It's a sense of sameness that rests upon a material basis that is a parasitic economy. That's the basis. So that's a long way around uh, this discussion. Now, we are materialists. It's hard for a lot of people to get there because, you know, uh, you know how it is. When you're in love, what does the song say? Smoke gets in your eyes. <laughs> we are materialists. And when, what it means is smoke gets in your eyes. You really sometimes avoid seeing all the evidence when you're in love, don't you? All the evidence. Your polar heart gets broken. And you sit down with some friends and say, well, damn, you saw that this was going on. You saw all of this happening, et cetera. So, yeah, I did. I saw it. I just, just ignored it, you know. <laughs> because, you know, that's a form of subjectivism. And you base your understanding, your relationship on how you want things to be. 
not like how they are in the real world. We want to understand the world the way it is, not how we would like for it to be. If you want the world to be a certain way, you got to recognize first how it is today so you can get there. You got to knock down all the stuff between how it is and how it is, how it is now and what you want it to be in order for that to happen. So, if you want her to love you, really, you got to investigate all the things that stand between you and love. Sometimes it may be that you could lose 40 pounds. Might be. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> Better work on it. <laughs> Sometimes it may be offensive breath. Sometimes it may be that she just ain't going to dig you no matter what the hell you do. You went to Jenny Craig. You got stock in mouthwash uh, 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 companies. Still didn't work. You might need to reconsider this relationship. But you can't do it if, you, if your understanding is based on subjectivism, not on how things really are. So that's why we are materialists. And when I first came uh, to some kind of consciousness, I hated white people. I'm telling you something. I could, if if you, you could have known me. And I think Africans, that's, you got to go through that a lot. Africans have to go through that. Because I couldn't love myself till I learned how to hate white people. Because the, my reality had been defined in such a fashion that there was an antagonistic antipode. Is that best? Is that work all right? Uh, between uh, me and whiteness. My perennial struggle was to become more white-like so that I could like myself, and so that white people could like me. And it took coming into awareness, you know, hey, wait a minute. As Malcolm said, you've been had, you've been took, you've been misled, you've been bamboozled. <laughs> and, uh, and this is something that, uh, that was necessary for me to come into grips with myself. And, and, and the whole world looked differently to me, and I looked different, and my people look differently to me. I could see my people for the first time in a certain way. I could see my people in a, cer in a certain way. And, uh, but, but the fact is, that didn't answer the questions for me. Pure black and white. They white, they do all this stuff. I'm black, you know, I'm suffering from it. Because that didn't explain for me, that was the beginning, but it didn't explain for me why these Negroes we're doing all this terrible stuff to us. Didn't explain to me why somebody snitched on Denmark Vesey. They'll overthrow the, the revolution. Didn't explain to me Papa Doc Duvalier and all these other forces that were out there working against us. So clearly, the biological explanation was not good enough. It ain't good enough just because they're white. Don't work. Don't, nope, nope, nope. It don't work. Doesn't explain to me Barack Hussein Obama. I can't get anywhere with that explanation. But at the juncture, I become aware that, that we are talking about a nation. And I am a part of a dispersed nation. And that my salvation lies in the nation of African people coming together to win its liberation, right? Then my approach to everything can change. I ain't trying to make white people like me, you know, uh, or anything like that, or try to be like white people. In fact, I try to be more like myself because I'm searching now for my national identity. And uh, I can have allies. The moment I understand I'm struggling against colonialism, for example, as opposed to racism, the, 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 the NAACP and the liberal assimilationists are, are not the only ones who are hung up on the racism question, black nationalists are hung up on the racism question. They can't see anything because of racism. <laughs> Here you are characterizing yourself as a nationalist. 
What did Malcolm X say a nationalist is? What did he say? What did Malcolm X, he defined a nationalist, what did he say? If you're a nationalist, that means what? He said a black nationalist is somebody who wants what? Wants his own black nation. Isn't that what he said? He said that's what a nationalist is. So if you're talking about you want your nation, then this whole fixation that you have on race doesn't help you at all. You got to identify the nation. That was one of the features, one of the things that was significant about the so-called nation of Islam. It was trying to take on the national question. Why was it like that? Because it was influenced first by Marcus Garvey, right? Who tried to address the national question, pull us all together as a nation of people. And if you're a nation of people, it means that you have the ability to identify your objectives to liberate your people as a nation. That's the task, to liberate your people as a nation. That's what we are. So that means that we can enter into any kind of relationships we want to as a nation with anybody. We can form alliances with people and engage in the struggle for national liberation. And if we really understand the centrality of the question of African liberation for the emancipation of human labor on the planet Earth, we understand this one struggle. But it has to be led by the African nation. And, and, and this is the fundamental thing that we've concluded. And then we built an organization. When we talk about the white people in the African People's Solidarity Committee, or the white people doing this and that, the white people ain't doing any more than anybody else is doing. They are a component of our party. They are an organization of the African People's Socialist Party. So when you see a white person selling or whatever is sold at Uhuru Foods or any kind of institution, they are instruments of our party. They are not the white folks doing something. That's the African People's Socialist Party doing something through those forces. In the same way, the African People's Socialist Party has developed a strategy based on this understanding that will allow us to extend the black revolution into every white community in the world. They go to the white community they're not involved in a struggle uh, uh, for gay rights or white women's rights or workers' rights. They are, a, they are a function of the African Revolution under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party and the African Socialist International. In the same way, because, when, because of the eff effectiveness of our struggle for democracy here and around the world, when you walk into a bank that used to be one that only white people worked in. All the tellers, all the managers, and everything in the bank was white. And you go there and give them your money, and when you woke up and say, you thought you were awake, you were really sleepwalking, and go to, and say, I'm not going to give you my money until you put somebody there black for me to transfer, to give it to, to give to you, right? And so all the banks everywhere now got somebody black. The white-owned banks got somebody black in there so that you will keep bringing your black money to the white bank and you transfer it to the black person who's at the teller or in the black supermarkets or in the black department, the white department stores with the, because there's somebody black in there now. So when they take my money, they treat me nicer. They say, hey, brother, uh, give me the money to give to the white folks, right? And it becomes easier and more palatable, you know, uh, to do that, right? You can be dumb enough if you want to, to think that just because a black person, well, a black person's working there now, I think I'll go pick up all the money. Doesn't work that way. You, they say often to us, well, you trust in white people, you trust in white people, and I understand the question. Don't you understand that question where Africans say, you trust in white people? you damn right I understand that question. But we ain't building a revolutionary movement based on trust in that fashion. I don't trust you. But I don't have to, because we have organization. We have tactics and strategy. We have structures. We have rules of discipline. I trust the strategy. That's what I trust. In the same way when the white people hire you to work in the bank, 
They know you ain't got no money. They know your cousin broke. They know you related to a crackhead. They still let you work there, not because they trust you, because they trust their system, they trust their process, and they trust that if you mess up, something going to happen to your ass. Right? They don't base that relationship on subjectivism. You give me 40 pounds overweight. Get a job as a teller. They don't base it on subjectivism. They are materialists. We are materialists in that regard. One. Second, in saying this, I do not intend, like there's a well-known fellow, used to be well-known, particularly in the 1960s, and, you know, uh, he, he used to be, uh, at the time of the Black Power Movement, uh, he ended up having to explain why he had been married to like white woman or white women. And, you know, the woman was his wife and she bore children, his children. His response was, uh, because when you got a cow, you're supposed to milk her or something to that effect. Now, I don't think there was nothing principle about that response. You understand? I mean, you know, you, you, you might have a political position on that question today that's different from what you had then, and that's all right, because the thing about the contradiction that you make, the error that you make is not the biggest thing. The biggest thing is, is whether or not you can correct the error, and you can explain the error so that, you know, uh, if, if that's the case. But, so I'm not, I'm not, I don't want anybody to think that we're talking about milking cows here. I'm saying beyond that, that we are a part, the party of the future. We're building a revolutionary movement that makes the assumption that human society does not have to be like it is. We understand that the future of the people on the planet Earth is the success of the African liberation movement. The liberation, the emancipation of Africa, African people, the consolidation of the African nation is, is, is a prerequisite, a prerequisite for the withering away of nations themselves, the destruction of borders that separate human beings in some artificial fashion, the development of a real economy that is not based on parasitism and the theft of life and resources by some humans from other human beings. That's what we believe. And so I just wanted to say those things, that this is our party. And the APSC is an instrument of our party. It's a party organization. When it does something, that ain't the white folks doing something. You know who the white folks are? The white folks are those who say that a, these, this market that we have, this Saturday market that APSC is running in Oakland, California, let's organize a boycott to shut it down because it's a part of the black revolution. Those are the white people. The white people who are those who say that when they, uh, in Oakland, California, because the, the, uh, the NP dumb comes out in defense of, uh, of Lavelle Mixon, who uh, successfully uh, killed uh, four uh, terrorist uh, occupying military forces, the, the white people are those who say, let's boycott uh, Uhuru Furniture Store because it represents black power in the veil mixing of the world. Those are the white people. That's how the white people move. The party moves differently, and the party moves through the African People's Solidarity Committee, Committee, Committee that functions out in the world as an instrument of the black revolution. In fact, just like Obama is white power in blackface, the solidarity movement is black power in white face. That's how it is in the real world. That's, the, that's, that's materialism. That's scientific. That's scientific. And, and the fact is that the participation of the African People's Solidarity Committee in this revolutionary movement is, in fact, and that, that, that strives to uh, this revolutionary movement that strives to liberate and unite Africa and Africans around the world, that participate in this magnificent movement, uh, 
to consolidate the African nation, these North Americans and Europeans who participate in this work are participating in the process of the withering away, first of the white nation, of the white nation, the withering away of the white nation, which has its foundation, we've already said, on what? Parasitism. And if it got nothing to live off, no parrot, no host to bl of blood that they have to suck, then there is no basis for its unity, for its being there. So the participation, the liberation and consolidation of the African nation is at the same time a part of the process of the withering away of nations. And because you have the withering away of the white nation, and then it means that other nations, national entities, become historically redundant because we don't need them anymore. The only reason we got to have the African nation consolidated is to do what? Is to free ourselves and take control of our economy so that our, our people and our future, our children can have a future. That's what it's about. Not about some, some inherent uh, ass assumption on our part that peoples around the world have to forever be in these camps based on color. We believe that humanity can live together, but, in, but we have to get rid of the oppression and exploitation as a condition for that to happen. Then human beings can look each other in the eye as equals, as opposed to this relationship of slaves and slave masters. Our objective is to unite and liberate Africa and African people around the world in a new economy that does not require the oppression and exploitation of human beings for its existence, to do this in relationship with all the oppressed peoples around the world, and in the process of doing that to form whatever allies possible to do this, this being a fundamental feature, a fundamental component of what it takes uh, uh, to consolidate the African nation and, and constitute a process of the withering away of nations altogether. I've said too much. Um, I would like for, I, I didn't intend, I sort of did a little bit of what I wanted to do in the national question. And uh, what I would like to do at this point is to have Comrade Luese come up and, uh, you know, just, just talk about the national question. Because I, you know, there's a way you can deal with this question, and it's purely an abstract kind of question, but it ain't abstract. Uh, when Europeans dealt with this question, struggle around, it wasn't because some abstract, hey, let's have a debate on the nation. They, they had fundamental problems in society necessary for the development and the progress of, 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 of society. And they couldn't do it without solving some of these problems. And uh, that's how capitalism came about. And with capitalism, you had to free up the toilers from the feudal constraints that were imposed on them so that all of the people who work were tied to the land, couldn't go any place. The capitalists needed something else, didn't they? They needed labor to be freed up. They needed labor off that damn land so they can work in a factory, so they can go here and there, et cetera. So in order for that to happen, it meant they had to have some way to command the loyalty, the loyalty of the toilers. What's going to make the toiling masses then loyal to these tyrants who have been bleeding them and taking all their resources, what's going to make them loyal now? Not, not, not the sheriff from Nottingham. That's not enough, you know, to do it. Now something else has to happen. And this is why they have a common flag, and you tie them together in a common language, and you give them common customs, and they go to Easter services together. They, they appreciate Santa Claus together. They have Thanksgiving celebrating the murder of the indigenous people together. They do all this stuff. All of this stuff helps to identify them and contribute to the sense of sameness across borders. And, and the point is that the nation itself emerges to solve profound problems in a society attempting to emerge and consolidate itself around capitalist production and accumulation. Uhuru. Comment Luizi. There are a lot of different ways that, that, that this question is important to us. And that's, Luese, you know, he's, he's going to talk about it from, you know, from different angles and stuff, because there are questions we have, we're not tribals and all that kind of stuff and everything. But Luese, 
Louisa is our teacher. <laughs> Uhuru. Yes, Uhuru. Uh, well, first of all, I just want to say uh, f thank you to the chairman for giving me the privilege to, to be part of this uh, uh, debate. Uh, but I also have to say, chairman said, you know, <laughs> you know, I can say I finished. <laughs> Uh, the uh, the national question uh, is a uh, is a big question. Uh, one way uh, I came to consciousness, you know, uh, or my uh, path of, of development, basically to consciousness. When I came to Europe, uh, one thing I have to uh, to be confronted with is white people mocking Africans, using names like uh, Sambo, for example. And what I heard them saying that, and uh, but I said to myself, Sambo is a popular name in the Congo. <laughs> so I trying to make sense. What, what, what is funny about Sambo? So you go to school, you will see a lot of Sambo there, Lusambo, because you know, there are many you know, names like that. Uh, and also prayer, you know, the key word for prayer is Sambo. So they say Lusambo, a prayer. So you will have a hard time, you know, messing with people like that, you know. So it didn't make sense to me. Uh, they use names like Bambula. You know, Bambula also means to hit somebody. You know, so I mean, just hit those white people saying that, you know. So, but for them it was like funny, mocking Africans. Uh, and uh, you listen to music, uh, you go words like Mambo, uh, yeah. Conga. Yeah. And uh, these are speaking to you because you go to Congo, you... You, you, you go to the classroom, you see a lot of people whose surnames is Conga or Congo or Lokongo, names like that. You, you see that uh, everywhere. Mambo, you know, it means problems. You know, Makambo, Mambo, all these names are everyday names uh, in the Congo. So, and sometimes you also is telling me, this me, this my people. So it was quite uh, easy for me just to move around Paris, uh, looking for Africans from Guadeloupe, Martinique. To me, I was just meeting myself, and I, I also f found myself being uh, ignorant. What I didn't know about uh, Africans being in Guadeloupe, although in school uh, we, we, we had a lesson uh, about slave trade, but uh, the way it's explained, it just passed you uh, over your head, just like we were taught Egypt. I didn't even know the Egyptians were Africans. You know, it was just passed over my head. But one thing I saw was the picture of Africans uh, being on his knees saying, uh, I think you're familiar with that picture, saying, am I not a, a brother? I saw that when I was in the in Congo. What did it say? Uh, am I not a brother? Oh, man, I, I'm not saying, uh, it, it's a picture of Africans, you know, on his knee and uh, having his hand, his hand up like that. But it's quite a popular picture. I might not say it right, but I've seen it quite a few times. I saw that when uh, I was in the Congo. I didn't like that picture. But I didn't have the political uh, education. And uh, I didn't like go to church, you know, being on your knees, stuff like that, because in the school they asked us to be on your knees and to pray. Yeah. And that picture is one of the first images I began, I began to identify with slavery without really understanding what slavery was uh, at the time. Uh, traveling in Africa, uh, you go to like places like Sierra Leone, and uh, you see names. Uh, like uh, they'll say, oh, here we have people called uh, the Limba. That's ethnic uh, in Sierra Leone. But people's names also in the Congo are Limbas. You go, you know, in the Congo, you see people's surnames Limba. They say these are the local. You go in the Congo, people's surnames also the local. So you can see, read yourself. And uh, if you read uh, some of the work of uh, Sheikh Antadiop, uh, I was amazed by the way that he said, okay, I'm going to take this uh, so called tribe. But he says they're not tribe. And he explained why. Uh, he took the uh, Wolof. And he said, okay, if you look at the wall of people, you will see these names, and he took some names. And uh, Samba, or Masamba, is one of them. Ngoma, there are plenty of names like that. He said, these names come from the northern part of Congo. And you look at it and say, why, that's true. Then he said, these names come from the south of Congo. And he put those names down. Then he said, these names there come from Sudan. This one from Ivory Coast. This one from ancient Egypt. And that, to me, was just brilliant. And he said, this is just an example, and you can do that study for any part of Africa. And from there, you know, every time I had a chance to see a name. So that meant what you're saying is he was showing that the same mm. name yeah. existed in all these other places. Yes, right? exactly. And then uh, you have uh, the Ngoma down to South Africa. You send Ngoma, and you go to Senegal, you see the Ngoma. And uh, I was watching, uh, when I was in Sierra Leone, uh, is that the Football Nation Cup? 
I saw the image um, of one of these players. His name is like Bemba. Bemba, that was the Ivory Coast. Uh, you go to Congo, you see a lot of Bemba. And uh, basically, what I, Auntie was saying, we are one people. one people. We are really one people. The only thing we have to do is begin to analyze uh, what we, are, we have in front of us in terms of names. And you can do this, that also with your music, rhythm. For example, we just came from Sierra Leone. And I can tell you the rhythm I saw from uh, Moriba Town, that's where my parents, where my families come from. They play exactly the same. And I wish they were they could see, because we are one people. And we went to Ghana ASI 2008. And uh, I saw a guy with a string. And uh, at the end of the string, you've got two spheres. And there's a percussion instrument. So you can uh, make some sound. In my grandma's house, uh, there was that instrument. I always wonder what he was. When I went to Ghana and I saw that guy playing and I asked him to show me, but I couldn't lay on her how well to do it. But basically, the culture of Africa, you will see we are one people. You can travel in the Caribbean, come to the US, you listen to the music. Anyone who listen to music different part, from different parts of Africa, they can listen to reggae or jazz or music from Cuba. They can identify themselves as being part of some people. And uh, this is something you know, we need to do. Uh, I hope uh, people can experience that. That's why the trip we're doing, like going to Jamaica, Sierra Leone, help us uh, to learn how uh, to be one. But one thing uh, I, I can say is uh, the uh, African People's Socialist Party uh, is making just a tremendous contribution in uh, not just in this debate, but in building the nation, the African nation. Because we said, uh, German said many times, one thing that defines a nation is that people have a sense of sameness. What do you think the ASA is doing? Right. He's giving us a sense of sameness. We could be here in St. Pete, we could be in Paris, we could be in Sierra Leone, we could be in Dakar, with, you know, the Baba Baba Khan, you know, who is a member of the party, is now in the Senegal. We are analyzing the world from the same tool. We're investigating the world the same way, and we're coming to the same conclusion. We're developing the same slogans, touch one, touch all, wherever you go. Even uh, in, in places like Paris, we just say touch one, touch all, or one African, one nation, we ask, how do you say that in French? Okay, you say one African in nation, we tried. And it just resonated straight away. So. African Socialist Internationalism or African Internationalism is a part of the uh, ideas or the ideology that's defining the African nation because you need to have a sense of sameness because we have a mission. Our mission is to overturn colonialism, overturn imperialism. And uh, for us to be able to do that, we have to keep our people with uh, an ideology that allows the people to see that the struggle is not a struggle confined to one place. Because this is where imperialism comes with uh, tribalism. You're familiar with that. You watch television. The first explanation, or the usual explanation that is given to us on television where there's anything happening in Africa is what? The tribes. Yeah. And uh, we know it's not about a tribe. Because if it was about the tribe, then you will not be able to explain Barack Obama. That's what the chairman say. Mm -hmm. Because saying that the things is about tribalism is not the same thing saying that it's biological. Because when uh, the Europeans say tribes, you know what they mean. They mean uh, people are always uh, in that state, underdeveloped, inferior. These are always the people who are waiting for somebody to come and save them, help them. These are the people who need to be saved from themselves. Yeah. That's kind of image, the explanation that comes around tribalism, which means basically whatever imperialism does, when they intervene or when they say they're intervening openly, because tribalism is always imperialism anyway. It's a defense of imperialism. But when they're intervening publicly, they want to make the, the people to believe that they're going to help, they're going to solve the problems. When in reality, tribalism is a defense of imperialism. When you see anybody with trouble, you see any trouble war anywhere in Africa, as imperialist says that, you're looking at the defense of imperialism. Yeah. Look at, for example, a situation that may uh, emerge anywhere in Africa. You know, the uh, countries we're looking at today in Africa, all these borders have been defined in Berlin. Now, you take an example, Chombe, for example, because Chombe is a historical example. Chombe that was in the Congo, he was one of the guys that imperialism, you know, prop up to attack and that bring down uh, the government and murder uh, the government uh, of Lumumba. 
Chombe is in Katanga. And they split Katanga in two. They said you have the Kona Cats, that was the organization of Chombe. And you have the Baluba Cats. Those people who speak Chiluba language in the north. Now, if you leave Katanga, you go to what we call Kasai. People in Kasai also speak Chiluba. Now, you have people coming from Kasai who are in Katanga are being attacked by the people from Katanga who are also Chiluba speaking. So basically, the same people killing one another based on the borders the Europeans have defined inside the Congo itself. I'm not destroying Iran, Africa, but inside the Congo itself. So you will see somebody who's from Katanga attacking someone who is from uh, Kasai, but it's the same people, exactly the same people. And the tribalism allows people to do that. You also have the same people who are in Katanga who are also in Angola, also in Zambia. Now, if Chombe was standing for self-determination, yeah. he would also have to fight for the people he claims he's fighting for to be in Zambia, which is not a country defined by Berlin Conference, and Angola. But he didn't do that. Yeah. He never fought against the Portuguese. He never fought against the British who were in Zambia. But he was fighting Lumumba in the name of his tribe in Katanga. And you can see the whole thing is just bankrupt. It just, just lies and uh, no basis at all. It's just basically a uh, defense of uh, imperialism. So what basically uh, we have to do as African internationalists, not only give people ideology of uh, African internationalism, but we are fighting for the same solution, organizational solution. We can have tactical organization which is basically we create an organization because we want to solve a short-term problem that allows us to complete the long-term uh, 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 problem. What I'm trying to say is that uh, if you look at the African Socialist International, what the chairman has put down, we have an organization that speaks to the whole nation. Even though people were not aware they are part of the nation, but when they hear the solution, that this solution is for you here in the Sand Pit, this solution is for you uh, in Sierra Leone, it's for you uh, in Jamaica, in London, all these places, it begins to create a sense of sameness. Because there is no way we're going to win this uh, struggle against imperialism if we don't consolidate the sense of sameness. There is no way we're going to win. So part of our struggle is uh, basically reach out to our people and consolidate the organization that I take forward this concept of sameness because it's really key. Because when we begin to say touch one, touch all, around every single issue, uh, Fred, uh, Rio, or any other issue, then you know differently you're building the nation. Because the nation is not something we're going to build just one day we wake up. Is in the process of organizing that we are doing everything we can to influence every single contradiction. We have to jump on it, transform that into a question of a strategy as well, because we're trying to solve things we might see as simply being tactical questions, because uh, it might be just about uh, short-term uh, questions. But we have to do whatever we can to link everything to the long-term uh, 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 question, which basically uh, is a question of our uh, Winning our people to the sense of uh, wellness. Uh, another thing I want to talk about is uh, this question of uh, the way we uh, understand uh, Europe, uh, America. Uh, Chairman talked about that uh, before. Like uh, a lot of people, mainly in Africa, when we look at uh, America or Europe, we think. The, these places have always been there. People don't, I mean, you don't see any discussion uh, where America comes from. <laughs> but just remember, America, the United States of America, was not there as a state of the United States of America 300 years ago. Yeah. It's a new creation. It's a new creation. Britain as a state, British state, is a new creation. You had England that was split between landlord. You had France that was split between different landlord. 
even uh, uh, we talk about Christopher Columbus and the Queen of uh, Spain. There was no Spain That's right. when they came to Americas. Yeah. It was she was a, a queen. I'm not sure if she was a queen of uh, Castilla. Yeah. It could be the gang of Castilla, yeah. but uh, there was no Spain as a kingdom like that. It didn't exist. All these they are new creation. Yeah. Yeah. So the uh, African internationalism is really like uh, the primary tool uh, in our struggle to build the African nation because it brings ideology, which is history of, of Africa and the history of uh, imperialism from our own perspective. It's also part of because what we're trying to do is uh, tell the whole story from our perspective, from the point of view of the African slave. That's what has to be the story. And uh, this kind of discussion uh, does not really uh, exist. And people don't uh, have a really sense of uh, the history of the uh, United States of America of uh, Britain and France. And I think uh, it's just critical that we have this kind of discussion. So we begin to see exactly what is the state? What is the British state? What is the American state? How long has it been in existence? You know, how was it created? And uh, that will help us a lot. Because part of, uh, of our people coming to the consciousness uh, to understand this uh, question of, uh, of, uh, of the nation is uh, to, to make the criticism of the white nation. Because when you make the criticism of a white nation, then if we do it from African internationalism, then everywhere we are, we begin to criticize slave trade. There is no debate in Africa about slave trade, unless we go in Africa and bring that debate about slave trade. Because if there is a debate, it will be a debate from the point of view of the British government or the United States government. It doesn't exist. And uh, this also uh, is a problem because the consciousness of Africans on the continent is incomplete. Because they, they, they can all experience, when we say the Africans, two millions in jail in the United States, the African the continent, many of them, it will pass over the head. Because the criticism of the United States doesn't exist. So that's something we have to bring in, that part of the curriculum of anyone who is fighting for freedom in Africa is the criticism of a United States of America, of his existence, of a history, of all his deeds against African people and indigenous people of this country. So it's also in the case of France. So it's also uh, the case of uh, Britain. So uh, this basically, everything I'm trying to say here basically, I'm just trying to grapple with African internationalism, how you apply it, how you use it to basically bring to, uh, to, to the fore basically uh, the consciousness of Africans so that uh, we can really have a, a meaningful discussion on uh, what we're trying to do. We're trying to build uh, the African nation. And the African nation, uh, for us to be built, people have to be aware of, uh, of it. And people have to become conscious that uh, the solution <laughs> is the African nation. And because people don't know what the solution is, then we're going to you know, uh, turn in silks. And uh, that's why uh, uh, I believe definitely that uh, uh, African uh, ASI uh, and the African working class uh, our mission to be the African nation is uh, a tremendous uh, mission in history. Because as you know, Africa now is under the rule of African petty bourgeoisie. And the African petty bourgeoisie is the negation of the African nation. Yes. Because the African bourgeoisie is based, as you know, on a Berlin conference at best, yes. if it's not based on tribe. You know, if it's not based on the open, you know, servitude, you know, uh, uh, loyalty to your, uh, imperialism, the African petty bourgeoisie is a useless class, a class is an outdated class, uh, is a class of compromise. Uh, there can't be a compromise between the African nation and, uh, and the United States. There is no compromise. And uh, part of our, our mission is uh, to advance this discussion in a way that people begin to understand that uh, all the compromises have to be overturned. Because sometimes the compromises can be, and most of the time they are given to us as victories. You know, Mandela coming out of a jail, he was sold the whole world as a victory. The ANC is a victory, you know, when, when in reality the ANC is a compromise between the African and the bourgeoisie and the imperialism, which is a negation of building the African nation. Of course, the African bourgeoisie doesn't come out and say we're against the African nation. They are say we are for multiculturalism. We are for diversity, all these kind of nonsense. They're all compromises, you know. And uh, sometimes we're going to get confused when imperialism comes out and say they are against cultural or what they call multiculturalism. 
you know, when in reality is a compromise that saves imperialism, you know, and uh, we also just be uh, aware that uh, the bourgeoisie is struggling also to understand that, you know, because they pretend to be uh, enlightened uh, social force, but they're not. Most of the time, I like with the crisis that's going on right now, we can say the ASA is ahead of uh, any other social force, including the bourgeoisie. You know, the chairman read extensively uh, quotes from uh, Fukuyama, uh, Zabrzezinski, the other guy, Buchanan. Yeah. But you can see African socialist internationalists or African internationalism, or chairman is ahead of them. You can also that. So whatever they come with, uh, it does not mean uh, you know, uh, they are, are correct. So uh, I know I have uh, put some notes here, uh, but uh, if I have to add one more thing before uh, uh, I go down and sit and uh, I go to sit down and leave uh, the place of the chairman, I just want to say uh, the pedestal, pedestal, uh, that's really is fundamental in a building the African nation because our mission is to snatch that pedestal, you know, remove it, break it down because the African nation can't come to life, can't come to existence if we don't have, uh, if we don't have a, a successful struggle against the pedestal. It has to be snatched uh, because that's what is the foundation of the white nation. The white nation sits on the pedestal. So we can't build a nation sitting on the pedestal of our enslavement. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. That's why, you know, you can see the African people who is a treacherous class. Because there's someone, you know, who goes to the White House or go to the presidency in Africa sitting on the pedestal of our own enslavement, you know. So that's really is a, a fundamental contradiction. So our mission, our struggle is to snatch that, to destroy that. But we can't do that if we don't build a state power. Because the state power is what will help us to consolidate in short term, basically, the, uh, the African nation. Because it's not because you are victorious, it means that uh, the, uh, imperialism disappeared. Right. The imperialism will try to regroup, try to reorganize, and get back what we just uh, overturned. So, and the state, the state, the state, we are stateless people. Yeah. Not just the United States, we're in Africa too. Because the state in Africa is not a tool of the people. Right. It's not a state of the workers or the peasantry. The state in Africa, as you know, is the state of the African people bourgeoisie, which in reality is the state of imperialism. Yeah. That's why, when, when have you ever heard of the police shooting a white man in Africa? <laughs> Never. Never. <laughs> and uh, in fact, even the, even the white people are locked up in jail uh, in Africa, you know they will come out alive. Uh, and the white people know that. But if you're an African, you go to jail in Africa or anywhere in the world, it's a distress for your friends and family because there's no guarantee you'll come out alive or in a good shape. You know, because the state in Africa is a white state in a black face. It's there just to lock up the people and attack the revolution. So I just want to stop here and I just say uh, thank you to, for the chairman for giving me the opportunity to be part of this discussion. And uh, uh.